George Washington Carver is remembered today as a creative genius who made more than 300 products from the peanut. He overcame the barriers of racial prejudice and discrimination to achieve worldwide recognition as a man of science and a great humanitarian. But he was also a man of deep faith who gave credit to God, the great creator, for all of his discoveries. Hello, I'm Wintley Phipps. Today, the first of a two-part series on the life of George Washington Carver, man of science and servant of God. George Washington Carver was born in obscurity during the Civil War. But when he died some 80 years later, newspapers around the world carried the news. Why? Because he once refused a reported six-figure salary offer from Thomas Edison? Perhaps because he would not patent or sell his scientific discoveries, telling everyone, if I know the answer, you can have it for the price of a postage stamp. The Lord charges nothing for knowledge, and I will charge you the same. Or was it that he patiently endured a lifetime of racial discrimination, saying, how my soul goes out to people who have not found the first principle of true happiness and divine love which must rule the world? During the six decades since his passing, interest in this man of science and faith has continued to grow. We see a lot of growing interest in Dr. Carver. Um, we have a lot of requests from K-12 through students, especially who want to use the images on our website. But we also get requests from video companies and a lot of publications that want to use his images um, as part of their uh, educational publications. And we are seeing increasing volume on the website, I would say probably monthly 20 to 30,000 hits. And during Black History Month, February last year, we had 38,000 hits. The reason I refer to him as our most famous alumnus is because the interest appears to be substantially growing in him. The primary reason that people come to George Washington Carver National Monument is because they've heard about this scientist and the work that he was able to accomplish with the peanut and the sweet potato and soybean. That is basically the tip of the iceberg. Dr. Carver was so much more. His work with those plants, with those farm products is truly phenomenal, but the man and his life and time is what people come to learn about and to understand how this man, growing up at the end of the Civil War, was able to accomplish all the things that he was able to accomplish. This is the story of a boy who marveled at God's creation a young man who hungered for knowledge, and an aging scientist who taught the world the true meaning of freedom. The George Washington Carver National Monument was established on the very farm near Joplin, Missouri, where Carver was born and raised. It is the first national park dedicated to an African American. Some 60,000 people a year come to visit the museum see the Moses Carver cabin and walk through the same forest where one of our most influential scientists received his first inspiration. George Washington Carver was born in Missouri sometime around 1864. Because he was the child of a slave woman, his birth was not recorded and he never really knew his exact age. His mother, Mary, belonged to Moses Carver and his wife, Susan a couple who had no children of their own. The story is often told that while George was still a baby, he and his mother were kidnapped by slave raiders who planned to sell them in another state. Moses Carver hired a man to find them and offered a reward for their return. The man brought back baby George, but no trace of his mother was ever found. After the Civil War ended, 
Moses and Susan Carver raised George and his older brother Jim as their own. Jim was strong enough to plow and split wood, but George was always sickly and frail. Susan taught him to cook, clean, sew, and do housework. But his first love was nature, and there he found a world of his own. During his free time, young George wandered through the woods, collecting plants and flowers. He wanted to know what they were, how they grew, and everything about them. And deep within, there was a hunger to understand who had made them and why. He tells the story in one of his letters that he was converted to Christianity, that he accepted Jesus Christ into his life at roughly the age of 10 when told about Jesus Christ by a young white playmate. And he wanted to go to Sunday school. This young playmate told him about Sunday school. And it seemed like an exciting, wonderful place to be with lots of interesting things to do. But he understood that he could not go to that Sunday school because the Sunday school was for whites only. George Washington Carver was a man whose thirst for knowledge exceeded any fear he could have had in the obstacles that were put in front of him to attaining it, even as a child. A man who looked at his life no matter what the obstacles or the barriers that had been placed in front of him as a blessing, not begrudging the incidents that occurred, but learning and taking from them. Carver wanted to go to school as a young man in Diamond, Missouri. He couldn't go because there was no school for him. He had to go to Neosho, Missouri. He had to walk as a young man miles, sleep in a hayloft at night, and try to find some way to sustain himself so he could go to a black school. One of the most influential individuals on his life for the next three years was a lady by the name of Mariah Watkins, whom he stayed with. And he went to school next door to her house in a school called Lincoln, School for Black Children. Mariah Watkins' influence came as a result of her background. She was a deeply devout Christian, and she inspired or instilled in George uh, the idea of helping his fellow man. After learning all he could in Neosho, 15-year-old George Carver accompanied a family to Fort Scott, Kansas, where once again he worked for his room and board. Paying his own way and not seeking charity from others was a pattern that would persist throughout his life. But racial hatred was a constant enemy. One night, angry voices and flaming torches drew him to the window. Outside, he saw a black man dragged through the streets, then hanged, and his body set on fire. Already as a young man, uh, he witnessed a lynching, for example. I can't imagine any more powerful uh, oppression that might come to one than the oppression, the intellectual and emotional oppression that would come from witnessing a member of one's race being killed by a mob of people and knowing and understanding that that person who was killed was killed and hated simply because they were the same race that you were. Carver never forgot what he had seen that night. He left Fort Scott in southeastern Kansas and traveled north in his continuing quest for education and opportunity. The stages of his life are just fascinating within themselves. The first be stolen, you know, then raised uh, by the Carvers, where he learns as much as he can, per per you know, can learn in that environment, and then to move on at at a, at twelve, uh, on his own, to because he wants to learn more, and then to keep moving from one place to the other, 
uh, in this quest for knowledge. His odyssey took him to the Kansas towns of Olathe and Minneapolis, where he finished high school. Carver supported himself, made friends, and always participated in the services of a local church. His musical ability made him a welcome guest at social gatherings. He just knew how to do everything. He could cook, he could sew, he could make his own neckties. He was a musician. He sang, he played the piano. And I mentioned macrame and crochet and knitting and so forth and painting. Carver longed for a college education, but in the town of Highland, Kansas, prejudice again blocked his dream. He tried to go to a college in Kansas as a young man, applied and was accepted, but upon presenting himself at the college, he was denied admission because of his race. In 1886, he moved to the plains of western Kansas, where he took over a homestead and built a sod house. But George was not a farmer at heart. The year 1889 found him in the town of Winterset, Iowa, where he worked at the St. Nicholas Hotel and later opened his own laundry. Dr. John Milholland and his wife Helen noticed Carver at church in Winterset and befriended him. At their urging, he applied to attend Simpson College in nearby Indianola. It still seemed like an impossible dream when he began his studies there on September 9, 1890. With the little money left after paying his fees, he bought some cornmeal and beef suet and found lodging in an old shack much like this one and began doing laundry for other students to pay his way. It was never easy, but Carver never complained. A fellow student, Pauline Tyler, recalled her friendship with George Carver. He was so tall, and he was so thin, and he looked so hungry, and he just looked like above all things he needed was a friend. And he found one, not only one, but many at Simpson. Well, when our easel was set up a little bit later, George and I were so that we were between eight and 10 feet apart. And through those years, we became good friends. So I came up to the old chapel building and I just stepped inside. And there at the piano with George's back to me, his face lifted, his hands on the keys, and he was playing, there's a wideness in God's mercy, like the wideness of the sea. Bless his heart, we who thought he had so little, was really giving thanks on that piano. Along with art and music, Carver took the basic college courses. Not only did he find the education he desired, but a strong spiritual emphasis as well. He participated in chapel and Bible studies through the college chapter of the Young Men's Christian Association, and he attended church faithfully. And slowly, a conviction began to grow in his soul. In a letter to the Milhollands, Carver wrote, I realize that God has a great work for me to do. Probably the thing that surprised me most about Carver as I got to know him through his letters was, uh, was his spirituality. Um, I really had no idea that the man was so driven by his sense of purpose and that the sense of purpose was one that he deemed as being given him by God. At Simpson College, Carver pursued the study of art, one of his great passions in life. There he impressed his fellow students with his skill. His art teacher, Miss Etta Budd, also admired Carver's brushwork, but she offered a career suggestion that would change the course of his life. Even though Carver was a gifted artist, Miss Budd urged him to consider a practical course that could benefit more people. Etta Budd's father, Joseph, taught horticulture at the Iowa Agricultural College in Ames. Within a year, Carver had changed schools and declared his major as agriculture. 
But during his studies at Simpson College, the faculty and students had given him a priceless gift that he would always carry with him. In later years, Carver said of his time there, Simpson was the beginning. The friendly attitude of the people pushed me along. They made me believe I was a real human being. At Iowa Agricultural College, Carver plunged wholeheartedly into a world in which he worked hard to overcome the barriers of race and discrimination. Even though he was the first and only African-American student there, he joined the Horticulture Society, a debating club, and rose to the rank of captain in the school's Department of Military Science. He became the first trainer and masseur for the football team, and somehow he managed to earn his way by doing odd jobs for professors. Once again, Carver made many friends who often rallied to his cause. Once in the college dining room, a student who recently arrived from the South objected to Carver's presence at his table by rattling his silverware, scraping his chair, and then moving to a different table. But the students at that table rattled their silverware, scraped their chairs, and left the young man sitting alone while they went to join Carver. Among his peers, Carver's nickname was The Doctor and the college yearbook described him as one whom not even critics criticize. Art remained a cherished hobby, and one of Carver's paintings was selected for exhibit at the World Columbian Exhibition in Chicago. In the School of Agriculture, Carver's professors recognized his potential and encouraged his studies. Dr. Lewis Pamel and James Wilson became his mentors and lifelong friends. Carver was often a guest in the home of Professor James Wilson, a man known throughout Iowa as a gifted teacher of agriculture and also of the Bible. Scores of young men, including George Carver, attended his popular Sunday school class. Professor Wilson believed in outreach, and he enlisted many willing hands in the efforts to touch those on campus for Christ. Carver wrote to his friends, Dr. and Mrs. Milholland, Oh, how I wish the people would awake from their lethargy and come out soul and body for Christ. I am so anxious to get out and be doing something. The more my ideas develop, the more beautiful and grand seems the plan I have laid out to pursue, or rather, the one God has destined for me and let us hope that in the mysterious ways of the Lord, he will bring about these things we all so much hope for. George joined a small group of students who met in Wilson's office for a regular late night prayer meeting. In addition, Carver and Professor Wilson worked together to draw new students into the weekly Bible studies and meetings held by the YMCA. And it was through the YMCA that Carver found his greatest spiritual growth. During the summers of 1893 and 94, he was selected as a delegate to the YMCA summer conferences at Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. Here, in company with students from universities across the United States, Carver conducted botany hikes and enjoyed outdoor sports. At Geneva, the delegates studied the Bible together and sought God's direction for their lives. At one time, George and his classmate Charles Reed planned to go together as missionaries to Africa, but gradually, a different sense of calling began to emerge. After receiving his bachelor's degree in 1894, Carver became a teaching assistant and began working toward a master's degree. As his studies neared completion, with many options before him, Carver received a letter from Booker T. Washington. Would he consider joining the faculty of Tuskegee Institute in Alabama? Other schools had offered Carver more money. His present position offered greater opportunity. For several weeks, he made it a matter of earnest prayer. I don't think you can understand George Washington Carver without understanding the spirituality. To tell the story of Carver, the teacher, and Carver, the researcher, Carver, the scientist, without understanding what drove Carver, 
and that being his spiritual connection to God and his sense of God's vision for him as a man who would help the downtrodden. Without understanding that, one cannot understand George Washington Carver. On April 12, 1896, Carver wrote Booker T. Washington saying, It has been the one ideal of my life, to be of the greatest good to the greatest number of my people possible. And to this end, I have been preparing myself for these many years. Three weeks later, Carver accepted the job at Tuskegee and promised Washington, quote, to cooperate with you in doing all I can through Christ who strengtheneth me to better the conditions of our people. Mariah Watkins said to George, George, you must go out into the world and learn all that you can learn. And then once you've learned that, give that learning back to your people because they're starving for a little knowledge. George took that to heart. During the years at Iowa Agricultural College, George Washington Carver developed academically, socially, and spiritually. He could have stayed there and pursued a career in botanical research, but he had a greater calling, one that would take him from his own security in the Midwest to help people face the challenges of poverty and racism in the South. In early October 1896, George Washington Carver boarded a train for Tuskegee Institute in Alabama. Even though he had earned a master's degree in agriculture, he had to sit up all night because he wasn't allowed to sleep in a bed in the Pullman car. He could not eat in the dining car, and men younger than he would call him boy, all because of the color of his skin. But during the next half a century, he would rise to a level of fame and recognition unheard of for a person of his race. And through it all, he would acknowledge God, the great creator, as the source of all his scientific knowledge and accomplishments. That night, as his train rumbled through the darkness, he knew only that God had asked him to spend his life helping others, and he had said, yes. His greatest strength was his belief first in himself and his reliance on God to fill in the weak spots. So he considered himself as the tool through which God worked to reach those who were dependent upon him. He never gave himself credit for anything. He never bragged on it. Not Carver, but God through me. I think that was his greatest strength. I think his main goal in life was to find what his purpose was. What was he here to do and to do it? Most of us are looking for the whys. Why am I here and what am I supposed to be doing? Well, I think George Car Washington Carver figured out why he was here and what it, it was that he was supposed to do, and he did it. It's, it's kind of hard to assume that some of the things that, that I go through are things that I cannot overcome when I look at some of the things that he went through and, and kept going. And sometimes I, I have to go back. It helps to go and look at some of that to get some inspiration to, to, to move a little forward. And I think that may be what he offers a lot of people, you know, is that there seem to be little things that he will provide for you that, that uh, don't allow you to feel sorry for yourself. I think it is one of thinking of your fellow man and not so much of yourself of giving, not so much of receiving. And that's sometimes hard to do. 
but he did it. George Washington Carver lived with a sense of purpose which he expressed in these words. No individual has any right to come into this world and go out of it without leaving behind him distinct and legitimate reasons for having passed through it. How far you go in life depends on your being tender with the young, compassionate with the aged, sympathetic with the striving, and tolerant of the weak and the strong. Because someday in life, you will have been all of these. When he arrived at Tuskegee Institute, his greatest challenges and opportunities lay just ahead. When Dr. Carver arrived at Tuskegee Institute in October of 1896, he was eager to get to work as the director of scientific agriculture, but he was shocked to discover that he had no research laboratory, no equipment, no staff, and no established courses to teach. In addition, the school expected him to live in a bachelor teacher's dormitory, two men to a room. Tuskegee Institute was a fledgling, young academic institution when Carver went there, inadequately uh, prepared for doing sophisticated scientific experiments, no significant budget for doing the kind of work Carver wanted to do. So one of his first challenges was just uh, outfitting and equipping a lab. This is his microscope. I believe it's the one that they gave him from Iowa State that he brought with him when he came. When he got to Tuskegee, he did not find the type of equipment that he'd had at Iowa State and uh, had hoped to find, but he managed to create it out of bits and pieces of what he found, broken bottles, um, bottles, plates, teacups, whatever, and managed to put together a laboratory for his students. In retrospect, it's hard to imagine that Carver accomplished anything when you consider how many obstacles he faced. He faced, perhaps worst of all, the skepticism of white America at the time. White America did not believe that a black man could practice science. White America did not believe that a black man could do the kinds of intellectual exercises that the practice of science required. So I suppose what Carver had was his own conviction that God had ordained for him a mission to do the kinds of things that he hoped to do. But it would take all the strength Carver could find to meet the immediate challenges. Tuskegee Institute supplied much of its own food through gardens, livestock, and a poultry farm. In addition to Carver's teaching and research responsibilities, he was expected to manage the daily affairs of the Department of Agriculture, and that was neither his interest nor his gift. The situation often left Carver frustrated and angry. Someone who did have a temper, uh, <laughs> I think it's uh, one of the things that does that, that becomes interesting in terms of um, of his career here is he was a visionary. He could see where where things could go. Uh, sometimes the nuts and bolts or practicalities of the, some things were beyond him, or they got lost and his visions. Um, great inventor, not a very good de uh, poultry farm. Uh, Booker T. Washington was also concerned about the efficient and economical operation of, of the Tuskegee Institute. He wanted an accounting every day of how many new chickens do we have and how many new pigs and how many new cows and uh, how much money has been spent. And Carver had the, the soul and the aspiration of an artist, really. And I think it probably drove Booker T. Washington crazy. Kawa did not do well as a chicken farmer 
for things like bookkeeping, record keeping, money making, and making a profit. He could grow the chickens. He did that all right. But there was always fussing and arguing between George Russell Carver and Booker T. Washington about making the practical units like chicken, farm, and hogs, making it pay. And the strain uh, continued throughout their life together. When Booker T. Washington died in 1915, I feel certain that Carver was being quite honest when he wrote to Booker T. Washington's widow and told her that he was heartbroken and that one of his deepest regrets was that he had never told Dr. Washington how much he valued him and how much he appreciated his work. Carver had come to the South after the soil had been ruined by years of one crop agriculture that was dependent on cotton. During Carver's earliest years at Tuskegee, he began teaching farmers the value of crop rotation and the soil restoring power of plants such as peanuts, sweet potatoes, and soybeans. To reach as many people as possible, he took his message of conservation on the road. In 1897, Carver traveled in a horse-drawn wagon to visit and teach in the rural communities. Carver also organized farmers' conferences at Tuskegee where he offered practical help and encouragement. He often told his students, learn to do common things uncommonly well. We must always keep in mind that anything that helps fill the dinner pail is valuable. Farmers needed crops they could sell, so Carver conducted research to discover new uses for the peanut and sweet potato. In 1921, when he appeared before the House Ways and Means Committee to support a protective tariff on peanuts, he astounded the power brokers in Washington by showing them some of the many products he had made from the peanut including flour, milk, breakfast food, instant coffee, cheese, and oil. His allotted 10 minutes was extended to nearly an hour. Honors and recognition came to Carver from many different sources. I'm proud to come to Tuskegee because I'm proud of what Tuskegee has done. But throughout the Tuskegee years, Perhaps his greatest contribution was his quiet but consistent personal investment in the lives of other people. I met Dr. Carver at Tuskegee, and I was his uh, paper boy for 10 years. The Montgomery Advertiser, Birmingham News, and Atlanta Constitution magazine, the black newspapers, Chicago Defender, the Pittsburgh Courier. I delivered all those to him. He was a great reader. I was very much impressed with Dr. Carver. He had a very sharp mind, and he was always interested in the person that he was talking with. Interviews that I've conducted with people who sat in George Washington Carver's class suggest to me that Carver was a very demanding professor, that he was someone who employed the Socratic method. As one student told me, Carver would not tell you anything. He would make you work for the answer. He would continually solicit an answer from you by giving you just a hint of the answer. And uh, at times he would playfully um, reprimand people who seemed to him to be getting uh, a little bit too cocky and too uh, self-possessed about what they knew. I recall a student telling me that he started off a, uh, answering one of Carver's questions one time by saying, now Dr. Carver, I think, and Carver stopped him and said, Mr. So-and-so, who accused you of being able to think. He must have been a really dynamic, interesting teacher. Carver loved his students. He loved everyone because he saw in everyone an expression, a manifestation of God. But he loved what he was doing, and I think that love was one of the most uh, contagious 
parts of his life. He was advisor to the YMCA most of his career here, um, the Bible classes. The Bible class was basically a, a voluntary activity. The size of it was a, originally a, a small group uh, of students and it gradually grew to a size where they had to move it. I think the, the numbers that I've seen have been up of, of 100 students or more. I think the image of Carver as the scientist walked away quietly and uh, in, in his laboratory without having any contact with anyone is just not accurate at all. Carver loved to play, he loved to tease, he loved to joke, and uh, it was that personal side of Carver that made him so appealing to so many people. Dr. Carver encouraged his students to collect and identify specimens of plants and insects. Biographer Linda McMurray describes one incident where a group of boys tried to trick Dr. Carver by constructing an insect out of various parts of different bugs. When they brought it to Dr. Carver and asked him what it was, he took one quick look at it and said, I believe this is a humbug. I would walk to the campus to visit my father's class in architecture and then go across the street and visit with Dr. Carver. Dr. Carver made me believe that my visit was so important. One day he pulled out of his pocket a ball of string. He said, little girl, look at this ball of twine. This is for you and a lot of people like you throw away when you get a package from the post office. And he said, I save this string and I find a second use for it. I was grown up before I realized that Dr. Carver crocheted from that discarded string, embroidered, did macrame, and all sorts of things. He found a second use for everything. I would feel that his greatest accomplishment was the love of mankind. He loved people, black people, white people, and all in between. He loved Tuskegee, and he loved the South. Henry Ford tried to encourage him to join his company in plastics. Thomas Edison wanted him to join his company, but he was against leaving Tuskegee, said that his people needed him. And I think that was a true statement. They did need him. Imagine what it must have been like in the early 1920s when this gentle, soft-spoken black man was asked by the Congress on Interracial Cooperation and the YMCA to go into the South and speak to groups of young white males, all of whom had come, one must suspect, from highly racist, segregated families. And yet in the 1920s, somehow Carver, through his personal magnetism, his faith, his gentleness, his absolute sincerity, was able, able to overcome the racial hostility that whites who had grown up in the South, disassociating themselves from blacks, had always felt. I guess it's, it's spelled out more in the philosophy of Booker T. Washington in one of his quotations than in the ones from Carver. When Booker T. said, I will let no man drag me down so low as to make me hate him. So in action, this is the way it was with Carver. Carver was never disturbed by the negative reaction of whites to his personality. But he looked inside 
as opposed to looking outside. I think that made the difference. From Dr. Carver's meetings in the South, there emerged a group of young men who wanted to share his faith and vision. Carver called them his boys. Carver's boys were a collection of young white men who met Carver through YMCA camps or through gatherings of young men brought together by the Congress on Interracial Cooperation and who would come up to Carver afterwards and say things that intimated a desire to get to know this, this wise man better. And out of those post-lecture conversations, there emerged friendships that resulted in lengthy and sometimes a lifelong correspondences between Carver and these young white men and also resulted in visits by these young white men to the Tuskegee campus. Growing up in the South, I think that I probably had the prejudiced type of uh, feeling that uh, Southerners generally had then. My brother Cecil was working in Tom Houston Peanut Company laboratory back in 1929 and he met Dr. Carver there and on January the 1st, 1930, Cecil and I took a motor trip of 42 miles over to Tuskegee and he introduced me to Dr. Carver that morning. Until then I hadn't re realized that any black person could have a wonderful scientific mind and be exactly like the white doctors and the white scientists that I had known at college. But here was a man who equaled them in every respect, his mind and his outgoingness and his religious training and responsiveness were just so wonderful to me that it lifted me off of my feet. In the years to come, and, and matter of fact, in a very few weeks, he started sending us letters. It was a wonderful experience to get these letters because frequently he'd send something personal in there, a photograph or a clipping. This was the beginning of a close personal relationship where you feel this person is not just a blob, he is somebody special for me. In May 1933, Al Zisler was asked to drive Dr. Carver on a lecture tour for the YMCA through Georgia, Virginia, and the Carolinas. My responsibilities were to drive the car, be in charge of the car, but also to carry uh, Dr. Carver's uh, satchel of uh, samples that he, of items that he created. It was interesting to see the reaction of people. Uh, you might say the, the crowd were on the cold side, uh, if you want to call it that. But uh, after the lecture, uh, he, he just had that way of, of uh, he, he smiled a lot, and he answered questions. And after lectures, people just swarmed up to shake hands with him. I'm talking about white people as well as black. Of course, the thing that surprised me was he has a high-pitched voice, very high-pitched voice, and that's the result of, a, of a, an injury he had, I think, from whooping cough when he was a child. The day is here. Tomorrow is lightening up the distant horizon with new and unheard of dreams brought with almost unlimited possibilities for everyone who is prepared to do what the world wants done. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. When you look at the power that Carver had over audiences, and you hear this voice, you have to conclude that there was something about his overall presence that must have captivated audiences. The voice certainly didn't do it. 
So there must have been something about being in Carver's presence that had a magnetic effect upon people who saw him and heard him. I had heard it said that he used to talk with God. And he'd, he'd go out early in the morning uh, for a walk and pick up plants and things to, to drag into his lab. And uh, he, he claims that uh, he couldn't have accomplished for what he did, this made the discoveries for what he did, except for his touches with God. He said, without God to draw aside the curtains, I would be helpless. Here was a man who could go out in the morning and find God in anything and everything that he encountered, whether it was a flower, a piece of grass, a bird, a tree. Uh, he found God in everything. And because he searched for God in everything, he found him. And when he found him, he listened to the word that God sent to him for that day. It was said that science and religion did mix. But I think it did mix with Dr. Carver. He was highly religious, and he was an outstanding scientist. And those things did mix. What other scientist, not even Einstein, gave God the credit for what he did, or what he published? At least, I'm not aware that he, that Einstein did. But Carver never made a major move for which he took the credit for having made it. He was only the tools through which God used him to make. That's the part that's prayed up less. Dr. Carver never married. There were stories of an early romance at Tuskegee that didn't work out, but no one seems to know for sure. What we do know is that George Washington Carver gave his life in service to God and to others. He often said, it is not the style of clothes one wears, neither the kind of automobiles one drives, nor the amount of money one has in the bank that counts. These mean nothing. It is simply service that measures success. Carver often said to people that there should be some evidence of your having been on this earth when you leave it, that you should have been able to demonstrate that you accomplished something. And when you look back at Carver's life, you can see a great deal that he accomplished. And in the broader sense, I suppose that's what we're all trying to do. And Carver taught us how to do that, and I think that's why people continue to be fascinated with him. When Dr. Carver died on January 5th, 1943, messages of condolence and tribute poured in from around the world. From his birth in obscurity, he had risen to great prominence. But in death, just as in life, simplicity remained his hallmark. And his grave near that of Booker T. Washington, just behind me, is marked only by a simple stone slab. And this bench is a good place to sit and ponder the impact of one person whose goal was to help the man farthest down. Carver refused lucrative job offers from Henry Ford and Thomas Edison, choosing instead to spend 47 years at Tuskegee he patented few of his discoveries, gave his knowledge and money freely to others, and left his entire estate to the Carver Foundation at Tuskegee. To those who knew him best, his greatest legacy was one of self-sacrifice and love. Throughout Dr. Carver's life, during difficult days of racial discrimination and personal discouragement, he always wore a fresh flower in his lapel. He took time to see the beauty of the world around him and to affirm the value of everyone, 
no matter what their color or station in life. One of his favorite poems was Equipment by Edgar A. Guest, and he often quoted it to close a speech. Courage must come from the soul within. The man must furnish the will to win. So figure it out for yourself, my lad. You are born with all that the great have had. With your equipment, they all began. Get hold of yourself and say, I can. 